Welcome everyone to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. I'm very privileged to have Mr. Mark Duda here, and we are going to have a conversation not only about this new album he's got out, but um, about just music in general and, and, and you know how things are around here. But Mark, before we get started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, man, I'm a, I'm a singer songwriter um, from New York. I've uh, been in the New York City area almost my whole life. Um, got a new album out, it's my first full length solo album called Bodega Flowers. Um, and I just finished my fifth album with the band The Handful. Um, so I've got both of those things happening right now. Uh, did, did I read correctly? You were playing uh, in a band in, in Italy? At one point, I did a project called Mad City Rockers. Um, it was a band from Italy. They wanted to do an album in English. Um, they were fans of The Handful, which is the band I was fronting at the time and still do front when I get a chance. Um, and uh, yeah, they called me up and asked me to do it. Um, we, you know, it was weird, connected over the internet. And uh, I recorded my tracks here in the States. And I didn't actually meet those guys until after the record was out. And I went to Italy and met them. But, you know, that's one of those things, how the internet has shrunk the world, you know? Oh, and, yeah. And good for collaboration, that's for sure. Not my preferred way to work, but it does enable, you know, folks like us to make a record together. So, uh, yeah, I did that right. That came out in 09. Yeah, something like that would have never happened before all this internet stuff. And it's no. a, it's amazing how... I think they would have known who I was, you know, so... Yeah, I, I've had uh, people that I've talked to that they've done a whole album where nobody's even been in the same room and it, they've all been, you know, different parts of the country or and whatnot because yep. of, you know, being locked down and whatnot. But uh, what's it feel like having your own music out there now just just you it's pretty cool you know I, I um I write sort of a wide variety of songs primarily a rock writer but do write anything from classic rock to, to punk to metal um, and I haven't had always had bands that did all those types of songs and so I had this this bunch of songs piling up that was heavily influenced by, you know, anything from New York Dolls, Johnny Thunders, uh, into Joan Jett, you know, Billy Idol, all that kind of stuff, that sweet pocket right there, you know, 77 through like 86, you know, um, they weren't the type of songs that I thought my band would do. Um, so I went ahead and I put out a five song EP, or six song EP maybe called Month of Sundays in 17. Um, and it did well. And I had more songs like that and continued to write songs like that. So I said, all right, let me do a full length. And so uh, Bodega Flowers is my first full length uh, under my own name. Wow. Uh, I couldn't imagine. Um, so going over some of the music, I want to pick out some of my favorites off the album. Um, I, 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 the first one that comes to mind is, um, um, is it Black Eyed Susan? There's a song on there called Black Eyed Susan, yeah. Yeah, so tell me what was the inspiration behind that? Uh, there, there's a lot of sort of characters that inhabit Bodega Flowers, right? Bodega Flowers is sort of a, um, a canvas for me to talk about a time when I was in the city um, from the late 80s to the late 90s and different people I met in places, places I was. And Black Eyed Susan's named after uh, a heroin addict that I knew named Susan. And... Um, when you do a lot of that stuff, you tend to get black eyes. So, um, yeah. and I, and you know, and I thought it went well with the sort of the theme of the album, Bodega Flowers is kind of like something beautiful wrapped in, wrapped in newspaper, wrapped in bad news. Um, something like beautiful melodies, but telling stories that aren't necessarily so beautiful. Um, and that's one of those songs. Yeah. You can take some, something that, uh, I guess the world would view as ugly and turn it into something beautiful. And that, that's, that's amazing. I will say, I, I was telling you before we got started, my wife and I were listening to it and we were, we were trying to pinpoint and, we, you know, number one, I know the voice and I was trying to remember where did I hear this voice before? And then we were trying to decide what, what about the music? And even though I can tell it's kind of got an 80s influence to it, I can hear a little, some rockabilly in there. No doubt. Um, yeah. You know, it, I, I like the fact that 
you've got a mixture. It's not the same formula through each one. I, I'm, I'm amazed because, um, you know, we have a mutual friend, which is Billy James and Billy sends me some great artists. Um, some, some folks I've, I kind of know who they are and some folks I've not heard anything from them. One thing that's been the continuing theme, it seems is more eclectic music. There's not, you can't put a, a, a finger just on one right. genre. And I, I love that. Um, well, you, you kind of, I guess, uh, explain most of the album right there when you said you, you yeah, have I'm, songs about, about, you know, so many different people and all. Characters of places, the times I had when I was living down there, um, mistakes I made, you know, uh, things I might have missed out on, but, but it's sort of about that time in my life. Um, yeah. And the music I was listening to at that time is heavily informing the album. Now, you mentioned rockabilly. It's funny, there, there's deliberately some of that 50s um, rock and roll element in there. I love traditional rock and roll. I love doo-wop. So you'll hear mm -hmm. doo-wop vocals behind songs that are sort of hard rock songs at times. And um, that's just uh, my way of spitting out everything I ever heard and liked at once. <laughs> I see my, I think the other song that I really liked on there was called Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Wednesday is, is a definitely a traditional rock and roll song. Uh, right. A, a guy that's uh, a guy that's complaining about uh, guy that's complaining about his relationship. Right. And um, you know uh, what she's going to put him through every night until Wednesday, you know, she'll die mad, which is the lyrics. So um, yeah, it's a relationship song. It's uh, deliberately tongue in cheek. And uh, that one definitely has a 50s feel to it. Um, I have Arno Hecht on sax on, sax on that song. And Arno's in Dion's band. Uh, and he also is part of the Uptown Horns who played with the Stones. So um, I'm blessed to have all the players that were on this record. But uh, his name comes to mind on that one because I don't often use sax, but you'll hear it there. Well, I noticed that you had someone on there that does part of one of my favorite artists of all time, which is Todd Rundgren and uh, yeah. Love Utopia. There's yeah, a, I, <laughs> I was like, oh, man, no way. <laughs> there's a story in there, actually. Um, so the first record I made, the EP in 17 as a solo artist, um, got in touch with Tommy Price. Um, who my producer, guitar player, Jimmy Bones, knew Tommy because they were both in Joan Jett's band, both in the Blackhearts. He, he got in touch with Tommy and said, you know, this is music you'd be perfect for. Put me in touch with Tommy. And listen, he's the guy that's actually playing on a lot of those records um, that I liked and I'm and influenced by. And so um, he came and played on the first album. And we brought in uh, Kenny Aronson to play bass. Kenny's pretty well known. He's in the Yardbirds now. But he also played in Joan Jett's band. He played in Billy Idol's band. Tommy also played in that band. So it was kind of like, OK, if you want the songs to sound a particular way, let's go out and try and put the guys together that can do that. Um, when it came time to do the second album, this album, Bodega Flowers, um, Kenny Aronson was uh, I was on a cruise or something like a rock cruise. Again, he plays in the Yardbirds now, and he didn't at the time. Uh, we recorded the first record. So Tommy said, let me call up one of my buddies. And, you know, I'm thinking he's calling his buddy from Staten Island that, you know, that he grew up with. You know, he's a New York guy and uh, he was calling his buddy that he grew up with, but it happened to be Chasm Sultan. And, uh, you know, put me on the phone. Guy says, hey, Mike, you know, my, this is Chasm. Uh, Tommy says it's great stuff, you know, I want to play. And um, it was wild. What, what a trip. Um, so uh, I kind of fell into that one. And um, Kaz came, came, came learn the songs. Um, and I think he tracked, he tracked the whole album in two days and he probably could have done it in one. Wow. He's an amazing player and, and it's a hell of a nice guy. It's... So I was really blessed to, to have the players I have on the record. It's a Cracker Jack band for sure. Oh yeah, um, and you did a duet with uh, Cherry Curry from. Uh... I did. Wow, tell me about that. Uh, that's a little. That's another one of those I get by with a little help from my friend's story. So, um, 
I had uh, I had written this duet um, for the the last handful album, which which came out. Handful hasn't come out with an album since late '15. <clears throat> Although we do have one finished, we're going to be putting out. Uh, so in late '15, we released this album called Sons of Downtown. There's a song on there called Dead Weight, and it's a and it's a and it's a duet. Um, and was looking for somebody to sing the duet to. And we had a number of special guests on the album, one of whom was Cheetah Chrome from the Dead Boys. Um, Cheetah's a friend of mine. I love his playing. You know, he's certainly a legend in New York from the whole CD scene and the Dead Boys and everything else. Um, and he's a great dude. So um, I had asked him to play on some tracks and I was mentioning the conundrum to him. And he says, you know, why don't you call Sherry Curry? Suggest, I said, I will. I, I would if I knew how. And uh, he said, you know, she's a friend of mine. Let me call her up and ask her. He called her and asked her if she'd be willing to take a listen to the song. And uh, here we are talking about it like seven years later. <laughs> um, her and I sang on it. And um, again, I think it's, you know, I've been around the scene since the late 80s. Um, I haven't burned too many bridges, haven't been that much of a, you know, try to be a good guy. I made a lot of friends along the way. Um, yeah. And I've played out a hell of a lot myself. So, you know, there, there aren't there aren't too many people I haven't met um, that play in and around the city the last 30 years or so. My, my favorite would have to be Ace Freely, though. Awesome. Insane. I mean, he's, you know, he, yeah, he's one of the reasons I play guitar, you know. Um, yeah, Ace was like a superhero when I was a kid and I fall right mm. into that into that wheelhouse. You know, um, I was born in the early 70s. So, I mean, I was a kid when when they were selling the dolls the first time, you know, and before I really understood anything about the music, you know, they had me with the, with the stage set up and the fire and the makeup and the blood. And, you know, to this day, I like, you know, rock and roll and horror. And uh, they kind of rolled that up into one. Um, and then when you got to listen to the music, man, it, it's ballsy. Um, it's raw. People think it kisses a slick band, but, they weren't back in the seventies. There's yeah. a lot of grit to those songs. Um, and, uh, and Ace is a reckless guitar player and, and he's very talented. Uh, he's tough to imitate because I don't even know if he plays anything the same twice, but um, he's, <laughs> you know, what can I say? He's Ace Freely, right? Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, he came out of that whole time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I remember as a kid, I had snuck around a little store behind our house and I would go buy the kiss bubblegum cards. Yeah. And I, I had the whole collection. So, you know, where you flip it over and you can make the, the whole nother picture out of it. Like a puzzle cards or something. Yeah. Right. Right. And my mother found them and Oh my God, I thought the world was coming to an end. Because, okay. And she threw all of them away and I yeah. got, you know, Kiss is the devil and all this. I got the of. same. It's funny that you say that because I got the same thing from my mom. Coming home one day, pulling the posters I got off the wall, you know, from Circus Magazine or from Cream or whatever it was, Hit Parader, you know, and telling me it was the devil. It's funny. Um, <laughs> I think that was a, a generational thing at the time, you know, um, that, uh, you know, my parents are too old to have been hippies. So they're sort of that last generation before people mellowed out a little bit, you know? And um, <laughs> listen, I was raised Catholic and, uh, and I absolutely respect the church, but, but to a certain extent, some of that gets to be brainwashing, you know? Um, I think we're uh, a little bit uh, comfortably, a little bit more removed from that these days in, in suburban America. My, the uh, most controversial thing I think my parents listened to was Jan and Dean. So, our <laughs> <laughs> Beach Boys vibe. That's pretty cool. But yeah. uh, nothing wrong with Jan and Dean. But right, Turtles, right? You know, all that kind of stuff. It's cute. Um, yeah. But uh, my folks weren't, uh, my dad liked Dave Brubeck, you know, put it that way. To him, like the Beatles were a little bit too edgy, you know? Uh, so, uh, you know, I tease him about it. I mean, that's, you know, let's be honest, that's kind of square. But um, now, now that, you know, I'm where I'm at, I do appreciate uh, the Beatles and Dave Brubeck and all that stuff. But um, like, uh, like you said early, I'm, I'm really influenced by the traditional rock and roll, the rockabilly and the doo-wop. Um, and then the, the harder, grittier stuff that was around just at the time I was in the city. Yeah, it was uh, like the cramps. 
that was punk and rockabilly kind of mixed yeah. together. Did you listen to them back in, in Absolutely. the day? Absolutely, listen to the Cramps, listen to the Ramones, you know, who oh, yeah. even, even went as far as to work with Phil Spector and, and loved those sounds of, you talk about Jan and Dean, love those, you know, those Beach Boys type of um, vocal melodies uh, Joey did, and, and they mixed that with punk. And so, um, yeah, this is my thing. This is my, you know, my New York thing where you start with the street corner doo-wop and you've got the rockabilly and then you've got sort of the harder, grittier stuff that that came along, um, you know, pretty much after glam crashed, right? So, uh, yeah. you know, uh, and uh, yeah, all that stuff has played in my head for years. And but I also write hard rock, which is you know the the band that I'm in the handful. I you know that's the vehicle for the more of the straight up hard rock that I write. Man, um, I've been to New York once. And that was a few years ago. We we uh we actually went for a convention there, and uh, man, I tell you what, it, it was a really cool place when we went to visit. I won't lie, I had a good time. I'm not. I don't know about now, but um, you know, it, it was. We had a blast. I, I had to go get the uh, had to get the pizza first, and then the. Uh, the cheesecake, which I really thoroughly enjoyed. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how do you make a cheesecake without having a crust? But, you know, <laughs> and, and I had to go find a hot dog vendor. I had yeah. to have me, a, you know, good old Nathan's hot dog. Mm -hmm. And, um, no but it, it, you've got so much influence in that city. You've got one, one side of town, you might be listening to the Cramps or the Ramones. And then the other side of town, they're listening to Billy Joel. So yeah. you've kind of mm -hmm. got a, uh, I guess, a mixture of that whole New York thing where you get an influence from here, there, and everywhere. Yeah, yeah, right. And hopefully at the end of the day, there's enough of a consistency in the way I sing and I play guitar and everything else so that that variety is like, okay, there's a bunch of different stuff, but it all sounds like Mark. You know, that's what I'm looking for. And um, like I said, it's my first full-length album, so I imagine I'll sort of evolve that. Uh, over time but right now you know these this solo record is like everything that I had and I recorded about 20 songs for it even though there are only 11 on it um, I made sure that it all made sense it all went to that story at the time in my life that it flowed well together um, you know a lot of people don't realize that musicians agonize over things like just the order to put the songs in you know and it seems weird now because a lot of folks don't even buy the record right they'll 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 download one or two songs that they like the best or they have a streaming subscription or whatever. And that's awesome. But in my mind, the way I make records is the way I grew up with them, you know, where you, you sat down with the record and the lyrics, you listen to it, you know, front to back, you probably rolled a joint on the, on the sleeve, you know, while you did it. Um, and, and, and that's what you did. And that was, the, that was your, that was an experience. It was meant to be, um, consumed at once in its entirety um and i still write that way because i know there are people like me out there that listen that way still um, yeah. But, uh, yeah so how does it feel to put your life on uh, you know to to um recording now you've put it out to the world and you're on that cusp of okay is people gonna like it or are they not gonna like it you know, I can only imagine how it would feel for myself, not that I'm a musician, but I'd be a nervous wreck. Um, how are you approaching this and how do you feel now? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think uh, fortunately, when I when I made the five song EP a few years ago, I just said, all right, I'll call it Mark Duda. You know, I never released anything under my own name. I had a, an album out with Mad City Rockers, five albums out with a handful um, but, you know, again, it, the songs weren't right for either of those projects. So for me, I didn't really think twice about it. Putting out the EP was a small investment. I just wanted to see would people want to hear this other side of what I have to offer, you know, before I go in whole hog. And, you know, um, so we so we did those tunes pretty quickly um, and uh, probably wasn't as nerve wracking this time around because that album sold pretty well. And so the answer to me was like, okay, 
well, you know, I didn't sell like Aerosmith or anything, but for me, considering what I'm used to selling uh, and, and uh, where I'm at in my life, I, I was very pleasantly surprised with the sales and the airplane and everything else. So I did feel more confident um, as a solo artist coming out with this record. But of course, there's still the fear that like people are going to put it in and say, ah, you know, it's all right. There's, there's, there's nothing on here as good as, you know, what's on month of Sundays, or, you know, these aren't as good as the songs he writes for the handful um, or something like that, because it is different. So um, anytime you're dealing with something that's unknown, you know, um, there's, there's some anxiety that goes along with that. Um, what's the biggest hurdles that you've ever faced in any point in your career? Apathy. Mm. You know, apathy in a band. Um, this is a little different because it's just me. But, but you know, even me, I'm at that stage in my life where um, I'm, I'm past a lot of shit. So um, I, I don't have the apathy. I hear, you know, I, Father Time's looking over my shoulder. I'm not going to waste time, um, you know, in the same type of situations I did in the past. But when you're growing up and you're in bands and these are your friends and these are the people you hang out with, um, and you make music with, and in a lot of cases live with, um, the mood between those relationships and the vibe in the room is sort of what comes out on the records, you know? Um, and that's, um, and you do deal with apathy because if everybody's not on, if everybody's not showing up to practice, if everybody isn't sober at the same time, if everybody isn't getting along with their girlfriend, um, it can affect the, the productivity of the band. And so I would say, you know, for me, it's just been taking too damn long to do things. Um, and even now I'm guilty of it because, you know, I've put out two solo albums, but as far as my band, The Handful goes, we haven't had an album since 15. I mentioned we do have one that's coming out, but that's just too damn long, you know? And so I think the biggest challenge is time, you know? Um, my voice is in good shape. I haven't toured a ton. Um, I've been mostly a recording artist, so um, that helps. You know, I should be able to hang around for a while and do this as long as folks listen. <laughs> but are, are you open to, to hit the, the road again? or Potentially. To... I haven't done any touring since 13. Um, and, you know, I'm a father. I, I had kids around then. So I've got, um, I've got a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of missing out on stuff is not something I'm real fond of. So for me to leave for periods of time, it really has to be worth my while. So you're more likely to see me at like a festival or a one-off show or something like that. Um, unless there would be a way where it could work out, you know, financially for me so that, uh, you know, I could still be, uh, be present for my family. Uh, that's not for sale at this point. Maybe in another 10 years when the kids have gone off to college and we're empty nesting and stuff like that, that'd be a little easier to do. Um, but fortunately, I'm blessed. I'm able to make a living in music and in other ways as well. So um, I don't have to be on the road, uh, in, on a bus, you know, and doing all that kind of stuff, even though, you know, I did it when I was younger, you know, um, yeah. not anymore at this stage. I, I, I couldn't even imagine. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm just a few years older than you are, but good Lord, man. I don't know how you, <laughs> you'd be able to do it. I, I get up in the morning with the arthritis in the hands and everything else. They, yeah. I, well, you do it. You, you just got to be, you got to be comfortable, right? You develop a certain, you know, a certain uh, a standard of living where you can't just sleep on, you know, fans' floors and couches anymore. And bands do that for years. That's part of it growing up, you know. Yeah. Um, but my kids are closer in age to making that, to doing that sort of thing than I am now. <laughs> oh, you're going to be out there rocking when you're a grandpa? Oh, yeah, God willing, man. Yeah, I don't see I wouldn't, you know. I do this because I can't help it, you know. Um, there's the, uh, it's, uh, it, it's who I am. I would do it for free, and um, you know, I'm sure I will be. If I'm standing, I'll, I'll be making records. <laughs> um, in, in all seriousness, though, um, you've, you have done stuff that some people can only dream of, and there's someone out there that's hopefully gonna watch this, and they're gonna say. I want to do that. What's your advice to, the, to that that 
potential next rock star out there? I would say you got to take the shot and you got to, you got to show up and you got to take the shot. So one is, you know, I've been hanging around for a long time. I played most of the clubs around here, gotten to know a lot of people on the scene. It's important, you know, make sure people know who you are um, and be around. Don't just ask people to show up for you. You show up for other people, you know, um, and, and that's just part of being a solid guy and a solid part of the scene. The other thing is don't be afraid to ask. I would say from my perspective, um, I, I've been blessed to work with some great musicians over the years who weren't named musicians. But um, I think back in maybe it was 2012 or so uh, when we started uh, recording uh, the Sons of Downtown album, because that album took a few years, um, we, we needed a drummer. And um, I wanted a drummer that was like a Bobby Rondinelli type. And that's what I was looking for. Craigslist, Bobby Rondinelli type drummer, you know, those couple of Rainbow records he played on, you know, uh, uh, the Sabbath record he played on. And I was talking to somebody about it. Hey, do you know anybody that plays like this? And the person I was talking to said, call Bobby, he's around, you know, it, you never know. Um, and so I reached out to Bobby, I called him, we had some mutual friends um, and he ended up recording the album for us. And, uh, you know, so he played drums on that. And uh, that sort of gave us the confidence just to start asking people, like we opened up for Pat Travers um, that same year. And uh, backstage hanging out with Pat and I said, hey, man, would you come on the record and, and play a track for us? And he said, yeah. And we followed up on it. You know, if you don't ask, you don't get, you know, right, right. I told you the story about asking Sherry Curry through Cheetah. Um, and, and I had asked Cheetah to play on it. And uh, it's funny, we, you know, uh, on the new uh, on the new handful record, we uh, we have some interesting guests. My buddy, uh, my buddy Jay that I founded a handful with. He's into a little bit more into prog music and jam bands than I am. But he reached out to uh, Steve Hackett and got him on the record from Genesis. And he reached out to uh, Jake Sinninger from Umphreys McGee and got him on the record. We had Cheetah come back on the record. Um, and so most of this stuff is just, it's from being around, you know, um, trying to do everybody else a solid, uh, make sure your reputation's good. Um, and uh, and and don't be afraid to ask. I mean, you know, with all those wins, there were a fair amount of people that said no. There were a lot of emails that went unanswered, calls that went unreturned. Yeah. Um, but uh, but you know, the ones we got were were pretty pivotal for us to um, one to change the handful is, is to uh, not just be in the best band in the bar, right? But being sort of a you know recognizable uh, name in hard rock, and then for me to get the opportunity to, um, to, to put out stuff under my own name as well, knowing that the guys I have behind me are, you know, Tommy Price and Chasm Sultan and Jimmy Bones and Arno Hecht and all those people. Um, so yeah, always show up and don't be afraid to ask. Uh, have you gotten, always gotten support from family and friends or there've been those in the family and whatnot? Cause I know I have that, oh, you know, you, you need to find a, a, a steady job, you know, something stable and all that kind yeah. of garbage. So I know there's kids out there that are facing that. Yeah, no doubt. Um, well, the thing is, you know, from my perspective, uh, I, I was blessed. I had a chance to go to NYU. And um, what I thought about at that time was, um, you know, either I'm going to be a rock star or I'm going to be an artist, an illustrator, something like that. And um, as I got, got around and sort of learned, you know, what was going on in Greenwich Village and around the city, it became readily apparent to me that nobody was going to care if I studied those things, right? Nobody cares if I have a degree in art to buy my painting in New York. You know, it's not like that there. Um, I thought, while I had this opportunity to go to school, let me study business. And so um, I studied business at, uh, at NYU and I, have a, and I got a business degree. Um, and I've worked jobs, um, you know, uh, regular white collar jobs throughout the years, uh, in addition to doing music. And so I think, you know, the example I said is it's not, you know, you can have one foot in two worlds, you know, it's better than starving to me. Like, you know, any job I got to go to, that's not rock and roll. It sucks. 
but if it didn't suck, they wouldn't pay me to do it. Right. So like, I, you know, I make a decision, I show up, I have kids, I'm responsible. I provide for them. It's what you do. And, um, uh, and, and I'm lucky enough that the music can at least be self-sustaining, you know, in other words, I'm not running off vanity projects and losing money on the records and, and, um, and that sort of thing. It's at least self-sustaining. Um, and that's important, but I think the lesson is, man, sometimes you just got to suck it up, you know, <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah. just be, and, and, you know, I, when I was younger, I used to complain more about this shit, but I honestly think that's a function of emotional maturity. Like I used to think to myself, like I'm better than these guys, green day or whatever else it's fucked up. I got to go to a job. It's wrong. By the time I get home from a job, I'm so beat up from that job all day that, you know, all I want to do is, is get wasted. And, you know, I'm not going to practice and I'm not going to do, but at the end of the day, um, you know, that that's the only thing you have control over. So if you make those types of decisions, um, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. And I know it's depressing to have a love for something and not being able to earn a living doing it. But very few people earn a living doing what they love. And that's just, you know, you, you need to be practical in this world too, you know? Hey, so I get lying. it. I get it. But, but if I, if I can work a regular job too, so can anybody else, you know? Well, I mean, unless you just knew somebody that they, you, you knew that they weren't going to make it at whatever they were going to do. I don't see why anybody would discourage you from chasing your dreams. You know, me personally, I grew yeah. up in a little town outside of Houston and you know, if you know anything about Houston, there's nothing but chemical factories or chemical plants and all that around there. And yeah, you've got, uh, you know, plenty of labor jobs for sure. And, you know, I got, into working for Brown and Root at one time and, and all these other construction companies. And I was an exterminator and I finally found a stable job working for the city with water and sewer and all that kind of stuff. Right on. I mean, it's a good job. Don't get yeah. me wrong. It's, it's a great place. If you know, you, you got a family and you're looking for something stable and you want to have you, your retirement, a nice retirement, it's great. It's That's absolutely right. great. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And there was so many Not times. Rock and roll. No, I know. I mean, I, I was going to be a, an artist. That's, that was my dream. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not a talented musician or anything. I can play the radio pretty good though. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got to, to this point in my life where number one, I had a heart attack. I was only 36. Wow. Um, my oh, kids, yeah. you know, my kids are getting older. I feel like my life was just passing me by. And then my first wife left 10 years uh, goes by. And I finally meet the, the woman that I'm, I'm married to now. And I was like, I need to start taking chances. All I wanted to do yeah. was move up to Austin away from all the garbage in Houston. And, I, and people started, Oh no, you don't want to move. You need to stay where you're at. You've mm -hmm. got that job, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, if you work for the city, most of the cities in Texas, you can go and your retirement follows you. So it's like, I can know I can get a job somewhere up around Austin working for the city. Right and on. Sure enough, I did. And, you know, I wanted to, there's so many things I wanted to do. And all I got was no, 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 no. You need to, you need to stick with this right. and come on, man. I, yeah, listen, you got to shoot your shot, brother. Like, like I said, you got to, you know, um, if you don't ask, you don't get right. And that's literal right. and figurative, you know, and um, right. At the end of the day, you know, it sounds, you only have control over you. Right. So I, it's, it's difficult for some people to ex accept, but you can't help what anybody else is going to say. Like I can help what, if somebody was going to say to me, um, yeah, people, you know, what the hell are you going to put out a record like this for? Everybody knows you from hard rock. Nobody's going to buy it. They're going to call you a sellout. And if I worried about, you know, if I worried about that, I wouldn't have made the record, you know, and we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. So that's, uh, like my grandmother said, uh, what'd she say? Um, worries the interest you pay on trouble before it's due, right? Shoot your shot and worry about today. Yeah, that's another thing. 
focus on the here and the now. That's right. You, what's happened has happened, and what's going to happen hasn't happened yet, and you don't know. That's right. You, you so much of your life will pass you by if you don't enjoy what's right in front of you right now. Oh. Yeah, I, I sort of feel like, you know, negativity is a self perpetuating thing. Like if you're if you're living in a negative space, that almost becomes like a self fulfilling prophecy, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, why not have your glass half full? Why not? It's the same difference, you know, as it being half empty, but it's a better way to look at it, you know. Um, and so, like we were saying before, there was a time in my life where I felt sorry for myself. I couldn't make a living as a musician or as an artist, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, not wanting to do the jobs I was doing. But then, you know, you wake up one day and you say, listen, I'm blessed that, that, um, that I've been able to find ways when the music money wasn't there to, uh, to do my thing, you know? Well, I'm... Um, um part of what I'm doing is trying to inspire others. That's why I bring people like you on is there's somebody out there that they they're in that job that they just absolutely hate. And there's something they really love and they they're too afraid to take that chance. And, and who knows? I mean, you might have that next Elvis Presley out there right now, but you will never know if you don't take that chance. That's right. Yeah. So is there someone that you haven't played with that you really, really want to? Oh, God, it's a good question, man. Um, you know, man, if we're talking just uh, wish list, you know, from fantasy land, man, Gary Rossington, Joe Walsh, you know, uh, you know, some of these Ace Freely, right? Um, uh, you know, cats like that, um, uh, you know, would, would love to stand next to him on a stage or in a studio. Um, no one even have to know about it. Um, but uh, yeah, that'd be a hell of an experience. Man, you got, you go from uh, Leonard Skinner to the Eagles to, <laughs> man, I, I'm with you though, man. It, it, it That's kind of like, the dream people that I want to have on my show too is, uh, you know, Joe Walsh. I mean, I grew up Joe listening Walsh. to James gang and hell and, yeah. And the Eagles and his solo stuff. And then of course, Gary Rosington, I mean, Leonard Skinner, dude, how do you That's get, right. what's better than Leonard Skinner? <laughs> so that greasy seventies, you know, Skinner man, that, that anything from the first album, right. Second helping, uh, Give me back my bullets. I mean, those records are crazy, man. Um, those are records with no bad songs on them. Yeah, I mean, there's no bad songs really on any Skinner record, if I'm going to say bad. But those records almost sounded like greatest hits records, those first few Skinner records, you know. Oh, yeah, everything wow. was amazing, you know. Um, and not to take any way, any way from Johnny because he's great, but, but Ronnie Van Zant was... You know, he was another Jim Morrison. He was another Robert Plant. I mean, he was a he was a front man, you know, to be reckoned with. You know, he had a powerful presence. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the early Skinner man. Wow. Tough to beat. You know, it's like it's like if you're talking about early Sabbath or something like that. You know, it's like what's not to like, you know, yeah. dude, uh, did you just about pick any of those bands from the 70s and, and they nothing can compare to them no. nothing in the, i mean and i love the 80s don't get me wrong i was a, i was the hair metal guy and anything hard rock and chicks dug it man oh yeah but something about the 70s dude that was the best time i mean kiss came out then and you you had what triumph started back in the 70s and yeah uh, I mean, you could just go on and, and on and Aerosmith, on. Aerosmith. Aerosmith, you know, yeah. yeah. Skinner, um, all of it. I know. Uh, yeah, we were talking about the James Gang. Tremendous, you know. Um, there, there's a period of time, you know, I, I was thinking about this recently. Like, if you go back, like, the last 20 years, right, you take, like, or 2000 to 22, last 22 years or whatever, and just take that as a sample of a couple decades, there isn't a lot that's changed, particularly in rock and roll. You know what I mean? There just isn't. Um, 
but if you listen to what happened from the time like Elvis took off and, you know, Fats Domino and those cats in like 56, and you go 20 years after that to like 76, 78, the way that music changed from that time and every, you know, all the spectrum that it covered, you know, how you went from, um, you know, guys like Carl Perkins and Chuck Berry um, up through, you know, you, you, had, you had the Beatles, of course, um, and then, uh, and then, you know, you get to Kiss and you get to the Sex Pistols and you get to, you know, it just um, covered a lot of ground there, you know, and I always dug bands like UFO, I always liked blues oh, bands. Yeah. Fog hat, you know, I like a lot of greasy boogie, old Molly Hatchet, the first five records, dynamite, you know. Um, you just that 20 year sample or so right there, so much more went on than goes on now. Um, and uh, you know, I, I got this theory that it has to do with collaboration. I don't think people collaborate enough. Um, like like you used to find cats writing for each other and playing on each other's records and showing up at each other's shows and getting on stage. And the atmosphere seems a little bit more like competitive, like we're the best and you guys suck. And I think when there's when you don't have that cooperation and that collaboration there, you know, it's tough to innovate. Um, you just get a bunch of one track minds all going on their own tracks, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, so much happened during that time in music and even the time, you know, I was born in the early 70s that I was coming of age, you know, and, and had formed my musical opinions, you know, by the time it was, you know, 88, 87, uh, for the most part. Um, yeah, it was mostly the music of the 70s. Um, even stuff I wasn't crazy about. Now I love Earth and Wind and Fire. Back then, it wasn't my style, but I still would acknowledge and could tell how good that was you know what i mean and that was like oh man this is uh you know this is a special band or even if you want to talk about the Bee Gees or cool and the gang um all the all the genres were popping everybody was innovating um you know you had cats like hall and oates come together and bring sort of that blue-eyed soul um into that whole mix into that whole you know, post new wave mix of the time that they came out. And uh, it was a very interesting time for music. And I, I think uh, it, it was a good time to be born music wise. Oh, that is no lie. Dude, I couldn't imagine living any other time. I, 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 I'll, I'll take that back. I have fantasized about, you know, living in the old West, but <laughs> when it comes to music, man, this, the late 60s, the 70s, early 80s that was the best time for music yeah yeah and i see I'm, the i see the zeppelin tag you got man oh yeah <laughs> right on hey listen not not afraid to wear it that's awesome i wouldn't yeah. say that i liked kiss but you know wow nice bro <laughs> you should see I was my office about getting rock and roll knuckle tattoos i had that idea my wife wasn't thrilled about it but we'll, we'll you know we'll, we'll see we'll see what happens we'll see who wins <laughs> out there but that's cool bro yeah, um, well, that's kind of like my my whole theme is the music that I really really love. Which, yeah, I mean, you're talking Kiss. I've got Iron Maiden tattoos, Van Halen tattoos. It's awesome. Um, the most recent, I guess you'd say, would be Rob Zombie and Godsmack. But okay, cool, man. But well, you're uh, definitely a music lover, that's for sure, and. Um, you know, music is, you know, not to sound corny, but it's a soundtrack to your life, right? It, it really is. It to me, it defines who you are. Yep. And and I'm with you. I kind of already made my mind up what I was going to listen to, and then as I got older, I started to appreciate some of the other That's stuff. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I can dig Paul Anka and Tom Jones just as I can dig Van Halen or right on. Yeah. You know, Twisted Sister. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and uh, with the collaborations, there was one, and I gosh, I wish I could remember the names on that album, but I know Sammy Hagar was one of them. Oh, uh, see, that's Kenny Aronson who played on, on my first record. Hagar, Sean, Aronson, and Shreve, H-S-A-S. Yes. So like you, got, you had Sammy Hagar from Montrose, later of Van Halen. Montrose, tremendous fucking band. Um yes right uh neil Schoen from from journey um kenny aronson who had who had already played with billy idol and joan jett um and michael shreve you know so uh 
yeah. you know, what are you well, gonna, that was it. That was a, I remember that was actually got a little love, I think, on early MTV. I didn't have MTV. My family was like the last people in the neighborhood to get anything, you know, whether it was cable TV or VCR or anything else. But I had friends that had it. And I used to <laughs> love to go over their houses because that's when they played videos, you know, um, and all the videos that were on at that time, you know, if um, you take like the HSAS video, we we're just talking about videos from, you know, Wasp and, and Motley Crue and Billy Idol and, um, and uh, all that stuff, man. I loved it. I even used to love the video for Don't Pay the Ferryman by Krista Berg. I thought that was a great song, you know, um, and, and having a video channel like that at that time exposed everybody to the variety right because their genre was video it wasn't a musical genre it was video so you heard all kinds of musical genres um contained within that video stuff so i remember digging on grace jones and then uh you know uh electric avenue eddie grant and then it oh was, my god you know, uh <laughs> grim reaper see you in hell you know you, it, all that stuff would happen in like 15 minutes um mm -hmm. it was a cool time to be around man cool cool shit to sample at that time when uh you know maybe sign of a misspent youth but um a lot of that's uh definitely shaped me in ways dude i i wish that um we had bands like ufo april wine uh, oh, yeah you know um like fog hat and, and gosh i could name off a million of zebra these are these are humble pie bro humble pie i wish they were those kind of bands are still company, around you know but, bad company zeppelin all that shit but like it, it it's it isn't gonna go away i mean that stuff the stuff that gets lumped in as classic rock um there's tons of new bands doing doing that style you know not tons of great new bands but but some you know rival sons is a really good uh band to come around in the last 10 years um and 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 you know there's there, there's a bunch of them but uh i think uh you know listen we we tend to buy and consume what we're exposed to and so rock and roll right now um is not primarily what what media is interested in at least not on the coast where i am yeah. um they're much more interested in um more urban culture and hip-hop culture and promoting um some of that stuff but what's funny is you'll see those guys in those genres of music out wearing metallica shirts and iron maiden shirts and a lot of them know that music and um you know i i don't think it's a matter of 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 that 70s style rock being finished i think it's just kind of you know gurgling up a little bit beneath the surface but it's never really gone away um yeah. you know as i'm like i tell you i'm raising kids i got a 15 year old son and um you know he's listening to jethro tull and cream and and stuff like that so it gives um, you hope it gives you hope no doubt <laughs> no doubt no doubt uh, my daughter loves the ramones she's 12 you know um so uh so it does give you hope um you know she also listens to taylor swift but listen you can't have everything uh, <laughs> uh, you know at least you got her listening to ramones i mean gee <laughs> well all that comes from right you're playing the music in the house and your kids will like what they like they won't like what they don't like you know i remember like being in long car trips with my parents you know i would dig like it was all am radio but i would dig on like uh um i don't know man like love and spoonful or uh you know jim croce or you know there was still some shit america you know there was still some stuff on am radio that i liked and that i grew on and that i still like i love that first america album um and just like them i think they they like stuff that they hear around the house um they certainly know my songs um I made it a practice to to sing to my kids at night as most people read their kids a book you know i always uh played and sang with them you know and they would sing with me and they developed some songs they would pick american pie a lot because it's long and i bet <laughs> they could stay up longer um but um those, those are great times and so i imagine yeah they they got some of that influence from me and, and a lot of it comes from you know, TikTok and all the other shit that I don't, I don't really know anything about, but, um, but rock has found its way into there. Um, 
in, into their lives uh, somehow. So, so that's cool. I think, I think it's an enduring form the same way um, blues is or, you know, American jazz or Dixieland. I think uh, rock or what we call classic rock is a genre that'll be around pretty much forever. <laughs> it's funny. I have the two-year-old grandson that's living with us right now. And the they rushed home and they said, you got to put Led Zeppelin on. I'm like, okay. And so uh, I think they wanted me to play a whole lot of love. And they said, you got to watch this. And here he is two years old and he starts trying to imitate Robert Plant doing the. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> I love it. Love it. And, and then um, I was like, well, I want to try something. So I think I played the immigrant song next and he tried to do the. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> yeah. And there's kids trying to do that. <clears throat> Now, all over the world, there's a bunch of kids somewhere trying to sing those songs, you know, and that's the point. We're, we're sitting here talking about it, you know, 50 years later almost. Um, and that's what's so cool about it and how that music is, you know, is, is undeniable, you know, um, really the last 60 or 70 years, right, since, since rock and roll, I guess, has been around. Um, but yeah, you know, kids are still picking up on it. Listen, what's good is good yeah that's you know it i can't complain because you know there was music that came out like i said we mentioned before when kiss came out and our parents just they're absolutely refused didn't <laughs> want to have nothing to do with it didn't yeah. want me listening to it yeah. they absolutely hated it and you know my kids they um i guess all the hip-hop stuff started coming out about the time they were little I know that my daughter was so much into NSYNC and yeah, there were those boy that, bands. Yep. Yeah. And all that stuff. And I mean, that, that is to them is what like, you know, kiss and UFO and all those bands. Yeah. Were to us. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true. And that's almost like, um, you know, the boy band stuff is almost like a throwback to, you know, the old time acapella and, you know, doo-wop stuff and, and whatever else where they use the different voices is really the instruments, right? There's instrumentation behind it, but it's not guitar, drums, bass, you know, in the sense that Zeppelin is, right? Right, it's right. typically a little something that's programmed and it's all done to focus around uh, the vocal melodies and the singing and the creating of teen idols much like they were creating teen idols out of guys like Dion. Dion's a hell of a songwriter and he's a badass too. New Yorker, guy from the Bronx. He happened to have the looks and, uh, and the voice that he could be marketed that way. Um, but Dion has succeeded, you know, in, in every era. So he's a little different, but, but that sort of reminds me of that. So you have bands like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and, um, and they're focused on as sort of being these matinee idols that can be sold. Um, the focus of the music is really on the vocal as opposed to the instrumentation. And, um, you know, uh, you take a guy like Justin Timberlake right now, he's phenomenally successful in the same way Dion was, but not everybody came out of that time um, being respected sort of as a, uh, you know, as a legitimate artist. But, um, you know, there are some of those cats that were in those 90s bands that are very talented. Um, you remember when we were kids, they, they were making idols out of Leaf Garrett and, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh my God, what's... Uh, David, Sean Cassidy. Sean Cassidy, that's who I was trying to think of, David Cassidy. Uh, you know, what we had the Osmonds and... <laughs> yeah. yeah super cheesy right like that's the uh, that's the other end of the spectrum where you know you'd have you have kiss and aerosmith and and uh you know uh, uh on the other side of it you had sort of this um really antiseptic music i think i'll, I'll that's a good word for it yeah because my parents would let me watch the osmond show but that's right. You, know, you couldn't have the Kiss poster. You could. You couldn't have. You couldn't watch the Paul Lynn Halloween special with Kiss on it. <laughs> and, but you talk about Paul Lynn, man. Some of those guys, like he was hilarious. Char Charles Nelson Riley was hilarious. They used to have those good, those good, like the Gong Show and and the Squares. And I don't know if those shows are still on, but you know the seventies was 
the seventies were wild, not just for music, right? It's kind of was anything goes. I mean, mm -hmm. no matter what you do now, right? You're not going to get, you might get as crazy as it was in the seventies, but not more, not really possible. You know, one of my, uh, one of my first really big, big interviews that I did was with Wesley Year. And if the name is not familiar, I know the show you what you had to watch the show was Land of the Lost. He was oh he hell was, yeah. He was uh Will Marshall. Okay. Doing and, battle with the is it, was it Will? Yeah. Marshall Sleep Will. Stack, the whole, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know it. Yeah. So, well, that I mean, Sid and Marty Croft shit was crazy. If you look at any of those shows. I mean, you had to be stoned out of your mind to make a show like H and R Puff and stuff, or like Sigmund and the Sea Monster. You know, mm -hmm. absolute lunacy. And the visuals from that that they did on a budget, like the puppetry that's involved and all that stuff, it's awesome. I mean, you know, but uh, yeah, that's funny, man. We're talking about Sid and Marty Croft, how's that? <laughs> man, I would love to have him on my show and just pick his brain. One of the Croft brothers. Because uh, I think it's Sid that's, I don't know, both of them still alive. I know Sid is. I don't know. I just, man, I went out years ago. Like now everyone streams everything. But years ago, I went out and bought a DVD compilation of like a whole bunch of Sid and Marty Croft stuff, you know. And yeah. it's cool. Every now and then it'll find, it'll find its way into the DVD player, the computer. And, um, you know, it was crazy. You know, a lot of original music in there, too. You hear a lot of that surf music, a lot of psychedelic stuff. You know, yeah, just just bananas. You know, who knows what went on with those guys? And Saturday mornings were the best in the 70s, dude. Yeah. <laughs> they were definitely the best. Yeah, Man, no doubt. I could go on talking about that kind of stuff forever. But unfortunately, we've kind of come to the end. Okay. So, um, now, do you have a website? I do. So my website is uh, markdudamusic.com, M-A-R-K-D-U-D-A, music.com. Uh, I'm also on Instagram on, as the real Mark Duda. Um, and I am on uh, Facebook uh, as Mark Duda Music. Um, and uh, the Twitter sphere and all these other places, I've got cats that do that for me, but I'm pretty much on all those, all those socials and all that stuff. Okay. Now, I really wanted to play some of your music, but unfortunately, with some of the rules like on YouTube, they uh, they flag your your uh, your videos if you have copyrighted okay. music. So is, is there anywhere that people can hear a sample of your music before they decide? Yeah, absolutely. If, if you go to any of my pages, markdudamusic.com or um, you know, there, I have a video up there for the, uh, one of the new songs, Astro Land. Folks can watch the lyric video. Um, I'm on all of the streaming services, so they'll at least play you part of the song, right, before they ask you to download it or whatever you're going to do. Um, and uh, there's quite a bit of stuff on YouTube you can hear for free as well. I think if you just go to YouTube and search Mark Duda Bodega Flowers, that's the name of the album, you'll, you'll probably be able to hear the entire thing. Oh, cool. I want to share all that with everyone out there. So I'm, I'll be putting up those links in the description. But Mark, this has been great, man. Um, a blast, I, brother. I, I love talking about the artist and, and the music. But when we get to reminiscing, I think that's my favorite part. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, cool. that's part of what sets your show apart, right? So that's, that's pretty cool, man. I'm glad we got into it. But uh, you're always welcome to come back, and, and uh, you, I, I appreciate your time. And all of you out there, I appreciate your time as well. If you're new to the channel and you stuck it out this far, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I hope you'll subscribe and please come back. For those of you who are regular, your support means everything in the world to me. So to all of you out there, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.